Hey everyone, this is a Goat and a Fox Talk About Movies. I'm Daniel Goldhorn. And I'm Raynard. And we're getting near the end of the summer blockbuster season. We should have lots of things to talk about. Well, I just saw Universal's new Dracula movie. Um, uh, uh, Renfield actually came out uh, several months ago, Reinhardt. Uh, no, 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 no. I saw Last Voyage of the Demeter. Want to talk about David S. Malkian and Ashley Franciosi getting into an accent off contest in between rounds of basic repetitive jump scares with spooky Count Dracula? Well, I just saw Blue Beetle. Do you want to talk about a bug-themed superhero who goes up against an evil corporation to save humanity and has to fight an evil version of himself? Or do you want to talk about The Adults, a movie where the only thing more awful than its stupid title is everything else about it? A completely exhausting, mean-spirited, meandering, pathologically unfunny, pointless piece of improv kid mumblecore trash whose entire cast and crew owe me a personal apology? Do you? Do you? I know, let's talk about a bug-themed superhero who goes up against an evil corporation to save humanity and has to fight an evil version of himself. But really crazy. And it came out months ago. <sighs> I don't know, I'm kind of allergic to anime-ass playground rules logic nonsense. <laughs> oh, Raynard. <laughs> That's what makes it great. Marvel and DC found dead in a ditch. In a world plagued by superhero fatigue, Hideki Anno writes and directs this movie that reminds us, oh yeah, cape shit can be fun. This reboot of the 1970s Japanese television series Kamen Rider is a blast from the past, complete with big goofy costumes, cool poses, and unapologetically silly phrases like evil infused augments, bioenergy, and my super duper mantis mask. Will Hongo the Masked Rider and Veruko the Android overcome the evil Shocker from destroying humanity? Will Daniel be able to stop this movie from destroying my sanity? Stay tuned and find out. <laughs> uh, yes, this is one of the most intense things that I've ever seen all, all year. And, intense is and a way to fun. Put it. <laughs> You know, and actually, real quickly, I'll uh, give a little shout out to a friend of mine, uh, Buster Corp. Uh, we share a Discord server together. And they were the ones who told me about this movie. Like, oh, you gotta watch it. And I was like, oh, okay, there's a screening here. I guess I see it. So I went and didn't really know much about it. And I was just like, oh my God. <laughs> I think, oh my God, is a very good distillation of even the first like three seconds of the film. It just, it's in there. <laughs> Off we go. It, it just it, it hits the ground running and just zoom. We're riding. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So what are your so uh, what are your thoughts? Uh, just like preliminary opinions about Shin Kamen Rider. Um, it's a lot. I I love its spirit. Um, it's. I do have to say, like, this kind of, like, Saturday morning cartoon uh, energy is, like, not for me specifically, but it is very unapologetically that, and I appreciate it for that. Um, I'll probably, I'll just get this out of the way here so we can focus on the film itself, but, like, I, I will say that this uh, Sheen Kamen Rider is part of kind of a, I don't know, not really a franchise, but, like, a, a greater kind of sequence of, of sort of these reboots or reimaginings or whatnot of other sort of uh, tokuatsu films or, or television series. I've seen three of them. I think there's also like a Sheen Evangelion, which I don't really have any interest in. Um, but like I've, se um, I've seen Sheen Godzilla came out first in 20, I think 16. Ultraman came out last year and then, and then this one. And I think of the three, this is the one that I responded to the least um but it's also the one that i had the least amount of context in i have seen a lot of godzilla movies i going through that like criterion collection box set of the show i era was one of my pandemic lockdown like sanity projects if you could call it that <laughs> and it's really interesting to see like how uh the kind of like spectrum that those movies can take on it starts out with ishiro honda's uh what 1954 film that's very serious and kind of this 
horror film that's a take on kind of just this sort of post-war processing of atomic horror and like but by three movies and it's like fucking king kong is floating on balloons and you have baby godzilla and it's just complete schlock and it never quite recovers from that except for with <laughs> uh Hedera, i think is the the kind of good one that's about like environmental catastrophe that's kind of got an interesting thing but anyway um the sheen godzilla is interesting for me because it kind of goes back to the uh roots it's like kind of a post fukushima disaster uh like meditation on kind of you know bureaucratic ineptitude in the face of disaster and while also having fun crazy campy nonsense like god so like he's like metamorphosizes now or some nonsense like which is fucking great so you get the fun feature creature stuff or creature feature plus like <laughs> again like something else going on ultraman's kind of similar at least in the first act before it decides like it fuck it it's time for giant aliens to punch each other insofar as like again it's kind of these like beat down like government officials that are like fuck here's another kaiju time to send you know the u.s another like payment so they'll bomb them for 30 seconds before the like the you know atm runs out or whatever it's <laughs> you know again there's like something else whereas this is purely just fun nonsense which is what it is yeah and definitely like because for me like i you know i'll like pretty much anything as long as i feel like there's like somebody cared about it and you can definitely tell that the people who made this movie cared about making something super campy very schlocky um just like this full throttle um embracing what the genre is basically because this is basically is a superhero movie you know the the common writer series i looked into it a little bit before we recorded here and it was like a superhero tv mm -hmm. show um and i actually come back to that a little bit um because there's there's some things that uh parts of the movie that are edited in this really interesting way where it's edited in a way that almost feels like comic book panels and Shin Kamen, uh, the Common Writer series, it was a TV show first, and then they made a manga adaptation of it. Um, but this definitely has a visual language of like, you know, shots will be in the same place, but there'll be like time between them. So like, you know, like, you know, 20 goons will suddenly appear out of nowhere, apparently. Like, like the camera will zoom in close on the bad guy, and then it zooms out, he has like a whole group behind him. Out of nowhere, basically. <laughs> yeah, it's it's got that. Yeah, I, I could see that kind of like panel-driven sort of aesthetic. Yeah, and uh, the the guy behind this, Hideaki Anno, um, I'm not as familiar with his work because I want to see Evangelion because he, on top of like there being like Shin Evangelion, he made like the original series as well. Mm-hmm. Um, my roommates tried I, to make me watch it at one point. <laughs> like now, yeah. <laughs> and you know, like I, what I do know is that it's you know it's famous for having some really crazy shit going on in there. <laughs> yeah. Um, and actually, a fun fact: so he actually worked very briefly for Studio Ghibli. It's kind of like a like a uh, almost like a contractor in a way. He mm -hmm. did um, Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind. Oh, so right at the beginning. Uh -huh. Yeah, he, um, because I don't know if you've seen that movie. Yeah, it's, it's beautiful. Yeah, like, he did a lot of stuff, like, kind of like the battle sequences, like a laser that, like, explodes yeah, things, okay. like, uh, and apparently, <laughs> there's an interview where Miyazaki is talking about him, he's like, he says Hideaki Anno is like, he's a space alien, he's deranged, <laughs> he sleeps under his desk with his bare feet sticking out, um, Apparently the two didn't get along because they would both believe they were right about creative decisions. But uh Musaki being like Keanu. very decisive about what he <laughs> thinks. That seems weird. Yeah. <laughs> um but Ano actually still came back, so he's actually the uh the Japanese voice actor, like the original voice actor for mm -hmm. the lead of The Wind Rises. Okay. It's always interesting um, when you get a director who's kind of who gets pulled back in for an acting role in that kind of capacity. Yeah, so he's just like it's a very 
Very fascinating fellow. Like, and I didn't know that he did these like Shin movies either. Like, so when I'm seeing like, oh my gosh, this guy, like, it's all, it's all connected. It's all, it's all coming together. Yeah, he did, I think, two of them and was involved in some capacity in all of them. Or yeah. directed, I should say. Um, yeah, let's, let, let's talk about this movie. <laughs> so, okay. And for, for a little bit of context for all of you listening. Is context um, possible so, with this film? <laughs> so I, I watched this when I came to theaters. I want to say it's like three months ago uh, now. Yeah, it's like, like March, maybe. Oh my gosh. Has it been that it's, long? I don't know um, what time is anymore, but. <laughs> um, so I saw this and I was like, I, I loved it right away. And you saw this just a few days ago. Yeah, I missed the um, theatrical run. Yeah. And it's like, as, you know, we were talking about, like, like what we're going to talk about with this. And you're like, oh, I, I don't remember what, what was happening. And I was like, oh, it's simple. And then I realized, oh, wait, I don't super remember it either because it just it goes so many different directions. Yeah, um, it's like both kind of simple insofar as like the first half is like take down these video game bosses and the back half is like here's the real video game boss, but there's a lot of like linkage in between, which can get muddy. Yeah, so I, I rewatched it today and I very carefully take notes. I actually watched this with um DM, the guy who does the subtitles on my main videos. Um and he had a very similar reaction as you did, actually. <laughs> um, yeah, so so the, the when the movie opens, uh, it will kind of split into like four acts, kind of like the, like the um, what did you call it again? I wrote it down here. The Kishul Tenketsu like story structure, the four act story structure. So it, it kind of pretty neatly falls into that. So the first act on. Um, like you said, like it starts like right off the gate. Like we have like a little like brief intro, like like the studio logo, and then they flash like, oh, it's PG twelve, and then just zoom. Like we'll put the first few seconds right here. a choice and that and then it just goes <laughs> um and again you just see like you know this editing and it's it's really interesting to see how they um will ape the you know the old schlocky 1970s um tv show style almost like a power rangers in a way where it's you know like they have to like use those, the different effects to create that kinetic energy and everything. Yeah, it's very kind of... It's kind of a little weird because it's definitely in that vein where it's like, like I said earlier, a Saturday morning cartoon or it's like Power Rangers or what have you. But it's a little bit more... It feels more contemporary in a way. Um, I think primarily for me because of the soundtrack. Like the score is very much informed by concurrent kind of um aesthetics or, or choices like with the, if you do look at the marvel or dc films it feels more in vain with that versus if you compare it against sheen ultraman which feels like it's a score that they ripped from like a 1970s like james bond movie or something like that so it's kind of a weird slight dissonance from like in that sensibility yeah, because, you know, you listen to, like, that that opening score to, you know, to that first scene. You know, it's very much a modern kind of, like, you know, big drums. You know, the choir's going, like... <laughs> the choir is amazing. <laughs> Hans Zimmer will swoop in with a blah. Yeah, <laughs> don't trigger me. <laughs> um, it's trailer music, essentially. Yes. But what's interesting is that there's also like this point where they will actually incorporate the theme from like the old uh, the old show as well. Mm -hmm. um, the da 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 da, yeah, which is which is a lot of fun. Fucking rips. Yes. Um. So we have this big crazy scene, and we were like, okay, some real shit's going on, and then it kind of slows down a little bit, and we get this exposition 
a um, little bit of like an exposition dump where he's like, meet the professor, um, who turned this boy Hongo into a grasshopper augment, we learn what an augment is, um, we meet uh, Ruriko, who's a girl who gets swept in with all this, she's like the professor's daughter, but like, you know, he created her to be like a half computer, I think she's like an android, something like that. <laughs> And then, um, and like, right when I'm like, oh, you know, this is, you know, the energy's kind of dying down. Then, like, spiders come swarming out. And <laughs> a spider, yeah. um, like, Spider Man gone horribly wrong. Um, yeah, kills I'm... a professor, kidnaps Ruriko, Hongo has to save her. Yeah, I think this is maybe my favorite stretch of the whole film, like the opening through that kind of like, okay, here's the basic rule set sort of thing. It's very, in a way, it's kind of the most stylish of the entire film. It's making a lot of really, shall we say, bold choices in terms of everything that's <laughs> happening on screen. Um, I think I like held my head at points during the opening when he's like taking out the... Um, initial bad guys who are the fuck they are i don't even know um and it's like it's not gory but it's got these like really operatic like spurts of blood that are happening it's like it feels kind of like i don't know like a tarantino movie like hill bill or something or like kurosawa's uh ron has that same kind of thing it's this just very like just curtains of red anytime someone like gets a paper cut and it's kind of phenomenal for that <laughs> And then that kind of goes away for a while, which is weird, but it's just a very, like, impressive way to start your movie, once you're like, well, fuck it, here we go. And it after that point, it kind of, I don't know if it ever quite managed to reclaim that exact, like, level of excitement for me, but what a way to, like, kick things off. Yeah, I think that's, you know, watching it uh, second time and everything, I did kind of notice that, like, the opening has, like, it's this massive rush of energy and everything. Um, and even like, uh, cause even, <clears throat> blah, I'm dying. Um, <laughs> after we get, you know, the exposition up, then we have like, you know, um, you know, Hongo, the grasshopper augment who decides to call himself mast writer, um, or common writer, uh, the title of the movie, uh, the movie. he fights the spider augment. Um, and again, that's like, it's a very over the top, very silly kind of a thing going on. Like, uh, we'll put like a little clip of it here, uh, <laughs> just like with the arms filling and everything. And the extra arms reveal is phenomenal. <laughs> like what the fuck is going yeah. on? Yeah. There's like a it's like very like body horror element to this, which I kind of adore. Like when they don't have their masks on, it's like. Buddy, can you put that mask back on? And like, I don't, I don't need to see that situation. <laughs> or like, uh, it's like a kissing cousin to Blue Beetle in that way. Like, Jesus, God, there's some gr like gross shit there too. Like, <laughs> yeah, like what what this really neat is that whenever there was body horror, there should have been like a little pop song playing. Um, I, that would have made it so much better. <laughs> yes. Um. Yeah. So it's like that first act, basically. Um. Definitely has like it's the most, you know. I th you know, like you said, it's the most stylish. And while I don't think the rest of the movie quite hits that same peak, um, in terms of like how utterly insane the action is, it does do a really good job of setting us up to for what to expect for the rest of the movie. Like, okay, this is a, like a cartoony world. Things are gonna be pretty crazy and off the wall be ready for it yeah it's very specific uh, insanity yeah um, and what's also interesting and, and uh the, the this first act like this first 15 minutes basically um it's basically the plots for every like superhero origin story so to say it's this yeah. like that like that first act would be stretched into like a two and a half hour movie by any other studio. <laughs> yeah. And, and here it's just like, okay, here it is. Here's all the things. Bam, bam, bam. He's on his way. He's doing his thing. 
Um, and honestly, like, this is a two-hour movie, and it feels like an entire superhero trilogy has been sandwiched into this thing. <laughs> it definitely does hit the beats of a lot of, um, uh, it's like an entire miniseries in that run. You know, you do kind of, it's certainly unique, but it does, if you kind of take a couple steps back, it does hit all the, you know, like you're saying, we get the origin story, and a little bit we'll get the, like, guy fights the bad version of himself etc etc so it is kind of still hitting conventionality but at a very rapid pace it's just barely like dragging along yeah it's just like the, the way that it hits those beats like very quickly it doesn't ling that doesn't labor them out um and that's something that i really like um and it's funny you say it's uh that reminds you of like a mini series because uh dm apparently uh, he told me he looked it up and this was originally going to be a series and then it got turned into a movie. Interesting. Yeah, I could kind of see that. Uh, yeah. Uh, like, I didn't see that myself, so I'm, I'm putting it entirely on DM. So if we're wrong, then it's it, it's him. It's him. <laughs> Not culpable. <laughs> um, Our high so journalistic act... standards are remain intact. <laughs> <laughs> um... So we get to act two, and this is my favorite part of the movie. Like this, like from like fifteen minutes to about fifteen, minutes. like um, the hour mark. Yeah, this is um. So we found out more about the evil organization. So Shocker is run by an AI named I, and a robot named K, and they were created by this billionaire with the intent to lead humanity to perfect happiness but instead of finding the maximum amount of happiness for the most people they become obsessed with instead eliminating sadness and now their augments run around with evil plans that they believe will eliminate sadness in one way or another but it's evil twisted ways to eliminate sadness because computers um, always make good decisions and they're never yes imbeciles <laughs> I think K is my favorite character in the whole movie. That's that's the guy with the <laughs> like the tuxedo, right? That keeps putting roses in his uh, chest pocket, right? Yeah, the guy his, who's just like who's just watching all this unfold. His vibe is really great. <laughs> Don't know quite the fuck's going on with him, but I'm fine with that. I want to spin off. Oh, just just K, just just it, wandering. It do like a force gump thing where you do just like an interesting style like travel series or something <laughs> just just putting the oh my gosh yes um so and they, so this part of the movie uh they go from like basically villain to villain mm -hmm. um confronting them so there's like there's a uh a really fucked up version of batman <laughs> Who wants to engineer a super plague that will kill off most of the population and will leave the survivors in a better world? And this was a point where I was like, okay, this this movie is is glorious. <laughs> His, I really like the um, prosthetics and makeup on that guy. Like, I have some pretty major issues with some of the special effects and whatnot that happen later in the movie, but I think one thing that certainly can't be faulted in the least is the gonzo makeup effects that are done this one there's some with some of the other augs that is really fun it's just super weird and campy yes it's like it's you know and i just love like, this whole little setup he has like this big old stage um in this huge arena and they do really crazy things with that um they he captures like Ruriko and then there's like thousands of Rurikos and then they all like dissolve and I I again having watched it twice I have no idea what that even was <laughs> the dissolving um, no I know what the dissolving was I don't know what the thousands oh, of yeah, Ruriko oh yeah even know that's yeah sure it's <laughs> it's happening on screen so it must be something that's happening um and just like, and the way like when he when he flies, because like you know he's like he's being all like oh you know like he's speaking very much in that over the top villain way like oh ho my plan shall create a better world. And then when he flies, he's just like this 
super flappy, like really silly looking. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and this, the, I think this point exactly, much as I love Mr. Bat, I, this is kind of where my, like, I don't know what to call it, cartoon sense started tingling and I started kind of like losing a little bit of faith in things. I, I wrote it to, he, he specifically states, he's not worried because he's got the like hole in his wing because he gets kind of, his escape gets a little fucked up or whatever. But he says he's not worried that Kamen Rider will be able to catch him because he, Kamen Rider can apparently only jump 66.3 meters. <laughs> it's never referenced again. And that in and of itself is whatever. But like, it's, it's again, like I said, playground logic up front, like, here is where we start to get kind of like retroactive world building where we're told something sort of after the fact and oh here's this new thing about the world that's always been the case but i'm only going to tell you about it now and there's no real sense that this was really the case until somebody didn't like the way the game was going on their the little jungle gym and they're like i have to change things so it's just kind of very like what the fuck and like he <laughs> can jump any distance he wants moving forward and it's just so odd. It's very like over nine thousand kind of situation with these the spe <laughs> absurd specificity of these rules. Yeah, because he's like, you can only jump sixty six point three meters. Yes, but my bike can jump however high I want. Like, great. <laughs> you can like Super Mario double jump with it. It's great. Yeah, it's like and only really, like that kind of thing is just like it's very. He said it's, it's very silly and everything. I almost feel like maybe it's like it's intentionally kind of like a parody thing. Um, but at the same time, I also feel like that can be an easy way to just be like, oh, that thing is bad. It's bad on purpose. Yeah. Just wave it away. <laughs> like, and I, again, have no context for the original series. So maybe 66.3 meters is super important. But like coming in fresh off the gate, like it, it's wild. Yeah, it's just like it's, um, but yeah, and I think, you know, when, when I watch that scene, what I also try to look for in these kinds of things is like, like, okay, like, you know, kind of like what the scene gives us. And what's interesting is that this scene with the bad guy on top of obviously being a very fun, funny kind of uh, thing going on there. I also get a couple things where we see like, you know, Ruriko, you know, she's been, she had to get like saved by... Uh, common writer by Hongo, but we see in this moment she's like, oh no, she actually is like is able to, um, not kind of hold her on as well because like she is able to stop his bat virus with um, and granted it's more anime style technology like oh, you said I have broken through your virus with my special device that can do anything basically. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's like, you know, we see that she can hold her own, um, and we also get this character moment where, um, Hongo, you know, he had been kind of horrified by the way he couldn't control his, um, action before. He's like, oh, do I go back? Do I, you know, do I help? You know, but if I lose control again, that could be bad. But eventually he decides, no, I'm going to act, I'm going to help Uriko, I'm going to help stop Shocker from doing evil stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and that starts, like, this whole sequence of, like, you know, they go th through different augments. There's a scorpion lady that I'm sure made <laughs> made a, a very specific uh, s subset of guys very happy that her scene exists. This movie is very <laughs> horny at points. <laughs> all these movies um, kind of are, to be honest. Yeah. I like how, like, all the different augments are, like, they have, like, Oh, their own things like, oh, my twisted plan will actually save humanity. And then Scorpion Lady is just like, I want to kill people because it, I don't know. It yeah, turns I mean, wrong, maybe. Honestly, <laughs> me, the day before I had to turn in my book report, it's like, whatever. <laughs> same energy. Um, I also have the same amazing outfit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then there's, uh, there's like a wasp lady. Who wants to enslave everyone to her will in order to achieve a perfect order? Um, yeah, is it? She, she was one of the big ones. She was like, she um, is because there's actually there is a little bit of a connection between her and Ruriko. Um, like uh, 
in the facility, like before all this craziness kind of erupted, like they were actually like close together. And Roku's like, you know, come on, you know, stop this, just walk away, please. Um and I thought it was interesting because through like in the first part of the movie, Roku was very much like, oh, like, you know, I don't count on anyone. Like she wasn't connected, like she wasn't close to her father at all. She's like, oh, don't care. Um, you know, I'm not gonna get close to you because, you know. But this is like the one person that she was cared enough about to be like, no, let's, you know, try to approach her, talk her out of this because I don't want to kill her. Mm hmm. Um, and for a moment, like, like you know, they, they stop her and Hongo is able to control himself enough to be like, no, I'm not going to kill her. And then the, the Japanese FBI show up. And they have these, like, scorpion venom bullets now. And they kill, uh, the wasp. And... It was a very... It's a very interesting moment, because, like... Pat, when you dig past the kind of crazy stuff that's going on, all this crazy shit... And try to be like, okay, what is the actual story that's going on here? You're able to connect a lot of interesting things together. There's this one, there's a sign in this part where, um, uh, you know, Hongo and Ruriko are like, they're kind of like, they're staking out, like, on the side of the road, trying to make the next plans. Mm -hmm. And this line goes, having an efficient body is boring. And it starts to, that really starts to put a pin in what the overall theme is here. And yeah, kind of looking at that there's something good going on with humanity and whatnot. And yeah, I do think here with her relationship to the father and with I my brain is deleted the entire wasp thing aside from the scorpion part. So I take your <laughs> word for that. But like it definitely it's it doesn't quite hit the mark, but it's nice that they're like going for like having some sort of like heart to it or like taking a step back and sort of being like well how can we look at the relationships between here it's not it's not we're grading heavily on a curve but i guess like the gold standard within superhero movies if you want to talk kind of like good balance between like the action of the story and the, and the sort of interpersonal relationship it would be like probably like james gunn between like guardians of the galaxy and suicide squad and whatnot but like this definitely is like angling for that and i think it does have its it's moments kind of of introspection which are interesting yeah and to be fair like i definitely agree with you because like because i can able i'm able to kind of put pull these connections together like oh this is what this connects to here but you know do, you know but could it have been stronger possibly oh for for god's <laughs> sake are you kidding me Anyways, what were we talking about? Um, um, uh, we we're talking about post okay, wasp. Like, yeah, like the wasp and like you know how like there's like some stuff like emotional beats going on there, but like and it's like you can kind of see how they play out, um, but it could have been a bit stronger because honestly, when I visit for the second time, a lot of it's like, oh yeah, like. I was like, what happens to, like, the, the boss again and everything? It's like, there were some parts, like, it could have been a little stronger with the emotional parts. Um. But, sure, uh, well, but it's about the punching at the end of the day, really. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. The punching is <laughs> always fine. So, we're coming up to the Act 3 now. And things start to kind of slow down a little bit here, so... The last half of the movie is about one particular augment, and it's Ruriko's brother, the butterfly augment. And, uh, like, she's been like, oh, we have to, like, trying to do something, like, before he wakes up to try to, like, keep him from doing bad stuff. But now it's too late. And there was this, like, SWAT team that came after him, and he took them all out. And their souls have been taken from the bodies and sent to a place called the Habitat, which is basically like super magic hell. 
Um, it's a place where hearts are bared naked, and it's impossible to lie. Awful. Um, Snake. <laughs> no thanks. So work. <laughs> it's like um, Ruriko and Hongo try to stop him, but he's he's too powerful. And also I love like he moves around like a total asshole. <laughs> he's like <laughs> swishing his robes around. He's like he flips his hair. He's got <laughs> the best hair of anyone in yeah. any movie. <laughs> and, and cheekbones. That throne room else... is pretty rad though, I have to say. With the like yeah, wings yeah. The, the... and the like nimbus and shit. Some production design for days. Yeah, this, the design of this movie in general is just really, really good. Um, it's just like, it's really captures that, again, I almost like, I used to say almost like a vintage kind of time where like, you know, nowadays like everything has to be realistic, you know. You know, Superman can't wear red underwear, that's too silly. Yeah, this has and no he, problems with being silly. It's like, it's... He was like, fuck you. There's a half mantis, half chameleon guy with his mask down the middle. And you're gonna deal with that. <laughs> um and so so the uh he also has his own masked writer called Ichimonji, who's been brainwashed by removing all of his sad memories and replacing them with Euphoria. Uh Ruriko and Hongo, they try to retreat. Hopefully Ichimanji. not the Sam Levinson series. Yeah. <laughs> he pursues, and, uh, oh gosh. Just, just the, the entire... Cameras and... Do, 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 do. The entire series has been beamed directly into his brain. Um, That would be enough to drive you insane, to be honest. <laughs> um. Yeah, so... so the two masked riders, they fight in a big CGI punch fest through an, an industrial zone, and I will allow this. Normally, I'm like, oh, I this hero won't. has to It looked like the fucking asylum a couple of times. <laughs> That's what was so great about it. <laughs> oh, it was bad. It's like, can we give... <laughs> oh, God. Like... I don't know if it had stayed a little more like campy instead of like let's replace these people with very bad uh <laughs> cgi like models like i would prefer to do, i don't know be on fucking strings or something but it did not work for me <laughs> oh uh it's uh yeah they, they they fight and ichimanji gets the upper hand he breaks hongo's legs but ruriko manages to Paraphilize? Paraphilize, yeah. I'm gonna put the was word on Was this ever screen. introduced before then? That was the thing that really drove me off the edge, was like, this becomes very much part of the vocabulary of the movie, but I had, I don't, I thought I passed out or something, but I don't remember that ever being a thing prior. I, I think that was like, I want to say that that was something that, that was what she did for like the bat guy. Like to sure. deal with like the virus and everything. Um I think that's what it was. Um I, I don't know, she could just she can just she can do shit. She can do things. She can do um, things now. So so she's able to remove Ichimanji's brainwashing, but then she's stabbed and killed by the half chameleon, half mantis og. Um Ichimanji dedicates himself to good now, though, and he fights the the half half mutant. Um, Mantis. Thing. But yeah, um, I will who say, was, like, you know, I'm very impressed because this movie managed to mash together both like every Marvel like you know man fight bad version of man thing, and then also bring in the like. Fast and the Furious, like, bad guy to good guy can vary about at record speeds even faster than anything that <laughs> franchise has managed. So this is, like, doing gangbusters here. It's just, it's doing every blockbuster. All of them. <laughs> all of every single one. All of them. <laughs> uh, it's like, even, even the, the CGI, like, the weird CGI thing, 
that's just predicting the the flash cgi baby God. scene you know that's like <laughs> <laughs> that's coming out this friday on streaming I want it. <laughs> Nothing but pain. um uh, anyways um we laugh and everything but uh uh ruriko dies it's very sad r.i.p very, very definitely sad. not coming very back sad. from that of course yes um very very funny. i mean she she turns into foam that's how you know it's real it's the the, the, the foam um she gets to a foam party. But, yes. but uh you know her last words are left on the helmet and again like it's this thing where like i don't know they like there's it feels like the movie has a lot of these like little moments that are like a really good that like that are impactful but i feel like it doesn't always cohe cohere together into like an overall whole if that makes sense yeah it's trying to accomplish a lot and it's really firing in, on all cylinders at all times and it's trying to kind of feed you a lot of different pieces of information or like kind of tell you to like okay like here's something to tease you and put that on the back burner but when you have like eight other things also on the back burner you start to kind of it becomes chaos. It becomes like me anytime I try to make dinner with more than one dish. Yeah, you know, because like, there's this because uh, she says, um, you know, uh, you know, with her father and her brother, everything like, you know, that she had this picture of her, you know, brother and her father like on a motorcycle and everything, um, and she always said like, you know, I wish that I could have been on that motorcycle, but I really liked being able to ride with you. And it kind of gives this idea, like, you know, he was the first real connection that she had mm -hmm. in her life. Um, and again, like, it's a really nice, sweet sentiment. Um, and there's actually, there's another interesting thing that happens in this act. Because, uh, now how I mentioned, like, the four-act structure and everything. Yeah. Um... This will be that this is now a storytelling class, uh, real quickly here I'll for be, everybody listening. <laughs> um, so normally when you think of like story structures, like the default for Western audiences is the three act, you know, you have a rising action, the middle point, like all the stuff happens and then the falling action. Right. Right. Um, it's like, you know, things built to a climax at the end of the second act. And then third act, everything kind of comes together. Whoosh, falling action. Um, but with this uh, uh, Kisho, Kisho Tenketsu, there's a very different uh, thing going on. So you'll have the first two acts, which are kind of like laying out, almost the thing of like laying out the pieces on the board, like laying out the story. So you have like everything going on with... Um, you know, Shocker, the other Augs, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, it's starting to build to a butterfly augment and everything. And then what happens is that in the third act, there's the twist. Um, and it isn't always like a... The, the twist isn't necessarily a uh, M. Night Shyamalan style, oh, twist thing. Because mm -hmm. um, uh, the twist in this movie is something that, you know, gets brought up... A couple times beforehand, it's uh, we find out Hongo's backstory, where his father was a policeman who had been trying to defuse a hostage situation, but got killed doing so. Because in his act of compassion, where he didn't want to hurt anybody involved, not even the hostage taker, he himself was killed. Right, and you get kind of hints of this throughout Pepper throughout the entire lead up to this. These kind of glimpses of a past memory, and you're like, hmm. I wonder where this is going. Right, you know, so it's not necessarily a twist in like how we might consider the sense of the word, but what it does is it kind of recontextualizes a lot of stuff leading up to this. You know, Hongo is kind of torn because he admires his father's compassion and he wants to mimic that, but he also feels hurt that his father had seemingly so little care for his own life and how that impacted Hongo his family that he got was left behind. Songo wants to use his power more to be able to protect 
himself, so to say, and protect mm -hmm. those around him. Right. Um, and so that kind of, again, that adds more context to what we've seen with him before. And when we go into the fourth act then, with this kind of structure, what this is, is that this is the harmonizing act. So what we learn in the third act um, now has to be and it's harmonized with what we know from the first and second act. So everything has to come together. There has to be a new understanding achieved, basically. Right. Um, so, um, and it's interesting because this story structure is often huge. It's considered like a conflict-free story structure because in Western um, stories, it's usually like, oh, the three act structure is very much, oh, fighting an antagonist go on, go on, go on, until big showdown. And with the 4X structure, it enables there to be a story without necessarily being an antagonist. Um, I mean, except he's literally trying to condemn everyone <laughs> to purgatory, so I don't know if that really holds up as an argument, but... No, this is this is absolutely a story without <laughs> conflict. Um, so the two Master Riders go face off against eight evil Master Riders, and they all... Um, have the motorcycles and guns, and they go. And now they have guns. Have guns been a thing up till now? I want punching. <laughs> Maybe the bullets were little tiny, tiny fists. <laughs> little, you never tiny know. Fists. <laughs> it could fit. It could fit in this movie. Let's be real. Why not? Like, <laughs> there's, there's actually this really good, um, this really cool shot where, like, because Hongo goes in at first alone, um. All the, like the evil grasshopper ogs, um, they surround him, and one of them like like pins him down and just like starts like unloading an entire magazine into his his helmet. And there's this really good shot that's following like one of the writers that's circling around them, and it's from like the angle between the wheel and the chassis of the bike. Mm -hmm. where it's like this little triangle window, and in that little triangle, you see, um. Like Hongo being pinned down and everything, and it's just like it's turning in place right in this little, and it's 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 this incredible shot. Like holy shit, that's such a good shot. Yeah, he definitely finds ways to kind of generate visual interest through kind of like looking at what he can do with the blocking and whatnot. And be like, okay, well, what what do we have to work with, and then how can I kind of put some mustard on that stylistically? Yeah, like. Like, you can really tell, like, this guy has a background in animation, because he knows his blocking, he knows how to, like, compose really cool images on the screen. Um, is absolutely, like, visually, this movie is so cool. Even with the, the little CGI punch fest. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, so, so... The two, the two common writer, they join up, they destroy the mechanism that was going to bring everyone to the habitat dimension, and the pair of them square off against Butterfly. And Butterfly like activates his powers, and his head splits, and like this butterfly tongue comes out of his forehead, and I hate it. <laughs> it's so oh gross. my I god! Love it. <laughs> so uh, weird. Uh, uh, I didn't. It like disappeared uh, inside the helmet. Like you know, I thought it was gonna be like sticking out the front or something. And they don't really do anything with it. They're like, here's some uh, grossness. Have have fun with that nightmare. Bye. Oh, uh, oh imagine if like he like use it to like. Starts. I don't know. Did he use it as like a whip or something? <laughs> <laughs> just like like this like. Instead of like punching and everything, it's just like he's just like walking around the room, like chasing after <laughs> them, just like Indiana Jones. Not even whipping, just like like looking at them. It's just, like, oh god, no! Oh. <laughs> They're just so grossed out. They leave. They're like, do what you need to do. <laughs> um, Is this before or after they made the like interstellar black hole happen? I don't remember. <laughs> Of the the interstellar black hole was when they they threw their bikes into the throne to destroy it. That's right. <laughs> Remember, this is a conflict-free story. Structure. There's no conflict here. <laughs> they are having <laughs> conversations in rooms, just talking. Just um, bugs yeah, so, dudes. So there's big epic fights. Um, I. 
also have to like slightly contest that. I I found the ironically the climactic battle to be the most like boringly shot of all these sequences. It was like a lot of shaky cam and it's like okay, I get that you're in a black room. There's not a lot you can do with that, but I could have done with something more there, maybe like maybe better fight choreo or something. Yeah, it's like after seeing like a lot of like the crazy like stuff going on, the final fight being like it's kind of like grappling, a yeah. lot of grappling and everything like most up. Um, apparently a good chunk of this movie was filmed with iPhones. Uh, yeah, that would make sense. With the <laughs> it was like okay, yeah. Leave. Um, there was this part that I thought had an interesting effect where, um, because, like, you know, they're, they're fighting each other, it's like, oh, this big, and then the music, like, kind of, like, fades, and then it's mm -hmm. just them, like, and it makes it seem, like, so small and everything, but, I don't know, that, that kind of worked for me, because it's, it coincides with the butterflies, like, his aloof nature has kind of been, like, broken through and he becomes more like you know why like you know you know what are you even doing here like you know why are you doing this like um and you kind of see more like he becomes more emotionally raw and that kind of sets up for um when hongo takes like his own helmet gives it to the butterfly and he sees his sister ruriko she just set, like, this big simulation for him mm -hmm. to try to, like, reach out to him. Um, it's definitely an interesting like, you know, like, choice after being so bombastic to suddenly be like, eh. Yeah, it's a very... And like I said, like, you know, it's, it's an interesting choice. Does it necessarily pay off? For me, it kind of does. Um, for others, maybe not so much. You know, it's yeah. art is subjective like that. There art we go. Like. <laughs> Truth. Um, so Ruriko says like, hey, you can stay in the simulation forever. But he refuses. He returns back to the real world. Um, but he still like he gives up his plans and everything. He's like, OK, I'm not going to do I'm not going to send everyone to super magic hell. Um, <laughs> he dies and Hongo dies. And. I actually really like that beat because in this moment he kind of does what his father did. Like, you know, he was like, I, he very specifically said, like, you know, I didn't want to, you know, do what my father did and die trying to save everyone. You know, like, I want to be able to save everyone but live. Right. Um, and I think that's a, v oh, go ahead. No, I was going to here you can kind of like, I don't know, rectify that. Yeah, it's like, you know, maybe in this one, like, he kind of has this new appreciation for what his father did. Um, sacrificing himself so that somebody else can have their soul saved, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. um, which leaves Ichimonji to go on to become the new common writer. Um, or maybe a sequel. They're saying, like, He's open to doing a sequel, but he doesn't have it, like, super planned yet. Um, but yeah. That's, that's Shin Kamen Rider. <laughs> that is, that is that. <laughs> and, Something and that really has a lot of, like, it has a lot to talk about. But, the like, which again is kind of my hang up on some of these kind of film is like very grandiose and existential topics but it kind of doesn't fully lean into them or the like the balance between the ideas it wants to talk about and the pontificating versus like the other material kind of it feels imbalanced for me and i think that's a very uh, good word choice because again it'll talk about these things um but the story doesn't always come together to show those concepts in action, so to say. Mm -hmm. It's like, how is it going to facilitate the exploration of this theme through the plot or the characters or the narrative or what have you? And, and again, like if I want to compare this against Shin Godzilla, I think that's a much better intentionality in terms of 
okay, we want to talk about these ideas and here's how we're going to kind of facilitate that through the story structure. Whereas this right. is like a fun Saturday morning cartoon that also wanted to talk about the soul. Yeah. So, you know, how do we define happiness? How do we make it? You know, how do we change the world around us? How do we use what power we're given? And I was like, say a lot of things about that. And it's like, and it is genuinely interesting. A lot of the things are interesting. It's not like, and we're not talking about. Heck, there's a fly in my room. <laughs> oh, is that a, a, is that a wasp in my room? Oh no, is it an og? Oh God, they, they found me. Oh, I think it is a wasp. Oh dear. No. Well, we'll finish this up real quickly here, and yeah. then I'm gonna deal with that. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's like it's a very. Oh, oh, jeez, oh, jeez. Okay, am I still recording? Yeah. Okay, good. So finish this up real quickly here. Um, but yeah, so it's a very, it, it's definitely a movie where if you want like a very serious, logical. Marvel-esque kind of world, you're not going to find it here. But if you want, like, something really exciting, something interesting, um, this is definitely worth checking out. You know, this is... It has a lot of personality, and that's something that you can't really say in most superhero things nowadays. It's got a very unique spirit to it. Yeah. Um... Yeah, but uh, do you have any closing thoughts about it? Uh, I think we've covered the major bases here. I don't have anything else in my notes that I'm lacking. I like the red scarves. Those are fun. Yeah, it's very stylish. I want one. They don't really know how to tie them very well, but it's fine. <laughs> That's not their superpower. <laughs> All right, well, hey. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. Um, thank you all for joining us as well to listen. 